that note, please, can we give a huge Bavar Bar cheer and welcome to the wonderful Nick Snails. Hey, I hope. Um, yeah, so uh, I came and did uh, Bavar Bar this time last year, actually, about my um, portrait project. Um, and that was the first uh, public talk I've done uh, since lockdown. And uh, the last one I did before lockdown was also at Bavard Bar at uh, the Tower. So it's a bit of a sort of um, sandwich of uh, uh, things. What I'm doing here is um, this is, sort of, is going to be a sort of mashup of the, the talk I gave before lockdown and a talk I gave after lockdown. Uh, so uh, my name is Nick Sayers. I'm an artist from Brighton um, and I make uh, are inspired by steam, and unless you're a parent of a child who's like born like in the last I don't know 15 years or so, you might not know, know what steam is. Um, it's science, technology, engineering, art, and maths. So it's normally STEM. So like like science stuff topics at school. Anyway, so that's what I'm inspired by from making my work. Uh, so these are, I'm just going to go through a series of different projects I've done over the years. Um, this is, uh, I guess, the one I've been doing for the longest. I make sort of mathematical sculptures. So this is a series of um, spherical sculptures, all different sizes, um, from, oh, hang on, I've got a laser pointer. Oh, hello. <laughs> um, so this is uh, tape measures, and it's about seven centimetres in diameter. And then this one's probably the biggest. This is actually this all coming. Uh, I'll refer to this later. This is um, a sculpture made for a school um, after the Olympics, where they I got them all to dress up in costumes of the world um, and pose against the green screen. And I made a uh, this spherical sculpture out of um, 60 different children in 60 different costumes. Uh, and the diameter is actually the average height of the children at the school, so it's a, it's a meter and a half. And it even had a little trapdoor in that they could get inside. Uh, you might recognise some of the other materials. So I, I tend to, I, I like sort of, um, sort of exploring sort of scientific subjects, but using everyday materials and sort of finding the sort of the maths and the sort of engineering of the everyday. So that's a theme that runs through my work. So this is uh, these are uh, train tickets. Uh, these are uh, coffee stirrers and toothpicks. So there's 630 coffee stirrers pinned together with. Um, 1,260 toothpicks. Um, and then these are, you can't quite see actually, so it doesn't come out, but this is um, uh, plastic Coke bottles slotted together. And this is, um, this is a, another small one, this is uh, origami made out of um, nice pastel drawing paper. So it's a bit of a, bit of a sort of obsession. I, oops, hello. Mm -hmm. oh, wrong button. Okay, so this is the biggest one I've made. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, a shelter dome made out of estate agent signs. <laughs> <laughs> so I've made these sort of small constructions out of paper. Um, and I suppose there is a sort of, again, sort of also like a political element running through my work as well. So this was sort of about, you know, I was renting a house at the time and it get, trying to get onto the property ladder. And uh, also there's like homelessness endemic around Brighton and around London, you know, all over the place. Um, and so it was just taking these sort of, these sort of consumerist sort of signs that are sort of litter our sort of urban environment and trying to make them into something that's actually useful as a, as a shelter. I've even used my own head as a sculptural medium. So this was a um, haircut, a mathematical haircut I had, um, using the width of the um, barber's razor to, de de um, to define this pattern. Um, and it turns out that I've got a hyperbolic neck. So there's a, there was a seven-pointed star on the back of my neck. Uh, and everywhere else there's like, um, uh, there's like five-pointed stars and six-pointed stars. Um, so it's the same way as like a football is put together. There's like hexagons and pentagons all over it. Uh, this is one of my sort of simpler sculptures. So I've sort of been working with all these right, really complicated um, uh, polyhedrons, uh, and I was invited to Azerbaijan to a um, recycled art festival, and I'd had this idea about making inflatables, so 
I decided to make the, the five platonic solids. The um, I'm going to get. I'm going to get. <clears throat> tell me to stop using this because I'm getting quite into this. Um, this is uh, the tetrahedron, uh, cube, octahedron, uh, dodecahedron, and icosahedron. And I made them as wind socks. And the gallery in Azerbaijan just happened to have wind blowing through it, so it was. Um, I didn't even have to get fans. It was just uh, sort of acted on by the, by the elements. And then I was invited back again to Azerbaijan later that year to make a giant uh, Christmas, seven metre Christmas tree out of plastic bottles. Um, so then this, I came along, so when I made that uh, sculpture out of the, the, the silhouettes of children, I'd done that using like green screen and sort of um, chroma keying and all sorts of clever stuff with digital cameras and image processing. And it was going towards a festival of like sort of world music and culture. And so I was trying to think of a way of like quickly creating a sort of body outline on, on like a piece of paper. Um, and my daughter was really small at the time and she'd, she really loved sort of like getting chalk from the beach in Brighton, drawing around my, um, my mum who'd come to look after her. And I had this idea. Um, I can't quite remember how it came about, but like I was thinking, when I was a kid I had this toy called a, a sketchograph, which was like a, also a pair of calipers and you could um, enlarge and reduce drawings with it. So I thought, well, if I make a two metre long one, you can draw around people at one end and you get like a little miniature drawing at the other end on A4 paper that people can take away. Anyway, that's become like a really popular thing that I've taken to various different sort of schools and music festivals and um, other, other things. Um, but people started off saying, oh yeah, I used to have a spirograph when I was a kid. And I was like, no, this is a sketchograph. So, but then I kind of got this idea that I should maybe make a giant spirograph as well. So I cut a bike in half. And um, so this, I, I should put some more videos in this, but like, um, with this you turn the whole frame around the crank. The crank stays stationary. And where the wheel once was, uh, there's now like a sort of little bucket of sand and it draws these sort of sand spirograph patterns on the ground. Um, and so I've made various uh, variations on this. Oh, so this is, this is um, so this was an 18 speed bicycle uh, and you can still change the gears with the, the gear shifters here. Um, and so there's three gears on the front, three chain, three chain rings and uh, six uh, sprockets at the back. So you get these 18 different patterns that this, uh, this one sort of spirograph bike can draw. Uh, I've done various, yeah, like I said, I've done a variety of different ones. This was one I made for um, an art festival in Egypt, um, and it was for a painting festival. And I'm very much not a painter, if you know me at all well. I'm much more into drawing. And um, so I sort of felt like I was sort of winging my way on there. But um, I thought, well, I should make a painting machine then, shouldn't I? So I made this out of a toddler bike, and it has um, these five different um, slots for paint bottles to go into. And um, uh, I did this sort of performance in the sort of foyer of the uh, the um, Charnel Sheikh uh, Hilton to a series of very bemused guests. <laughs> and then this was one that this was my last foreign trip before the pandemic. Um, I made another small, sort of travel-sized uh, bicycle sort of spirograph drawing machine out of an, another toddler bike, and this time it's using like these extraordinarily cute um, Korean kids are uh, sort of turning the back wheel, and uh, it draws onto the crank, so it's like the reverse of the you know, the other one. Cycling is also a bit of a theme through my work. Um, my other claim to fame is organising the Brighton Naked Bike Ride. Um, but uh, uh, this, this, sort of, this project united my two passions, which are cycling and um, the Voyager Space Probe, uh, with, which um, was launched in 1977 and um, uh, was timed to coincide with the alignment of the planets, which would mean that it could um, visit the four um, outer planets of the solar system um, in a over a period of, I think it started, it launched in 1977, I think it went past uh, Neptune in 1989 or so. 
um, and then it left the solar system when I turned 40. So it sort of, you know, it's launched when I was five. It's, it's still sending back signals, and um, you can sort of follow its Twitter feed. Um, it's amazing. It's just um, that it sort of lasted that long with the sort of 1960s, 1970s technology on board. So I did this project um, where I sort of scaled the whole thing down to uh, by a factor of a billion. So at this, and I sort of, being a graphic designer, I sort of made these, oops, I made these sort of uh, flags and like fences with the, uh, the sun and planets at, at scale. And I even found a golfing umbrella that uh, was the right size. Um, and so this was for Brighton Science Festival. I teamed up with um, uh, Darren Bastel from the University of Sussex, who's the um, uh, physics and astronomy uh, lecturer there. And so he gave a guided tour of the planets. Rather sort of fittingly, uh, Neptune was at uh, Bright Marina. So Neptune Marina, sort of nice connection there. Um, um, what was nice was even though this, the, uh, the, the planets were scaled down by a factor of a billion, the angular size was the same as on, um, on the, on, on, in the sky. So looking back from where we were at Earth, the Earth flag, um, the sun was actually the same size in the, in the woods, in this, this was at uh, Manchester Science Festival, as it was in the sky. And then I went, I brought it to, uh, to Goa for the, for the Story of Space Festival, like a sort of space science festival. Um, and uh, we went to the market, and again, very bemused um, Goan um, sort of market cut holders, uh, sort of, and me with my tape measure, trying to work out what size different planets were. So we found a, um, a peppercorn was the uh, was uh, Mercury, um, a chickpea was uh, Venus. Mm, uh, no, Mars. Because Venus and Earth are about the same size, so uh, Venus and Earth were um, nutmegs, and then uh, where is it? Oh yeah, so uh, Jupiter was a coconut with its husk still on and Saturn was with, with it taken off. And then these two things, we couldn't work out what they were called, I think they're called Karane. I think they're something specific to, to, to Goa. Anyway, they were uh, Uranus and Neptune. And then this was my Lego spaceman from the 1980s to uh, my mascot. Uh, so here's another thing, there's a sort of, I guess, contrived link here, because it's about, um, about the sun. So. In 2011, I went to this amazing event called um, uh, Maker Fair, which doesn't run anymore, unfortunately, but this guy was there showing how to make these super long exposure um, pinhole cameras out of these uh, lager cans. And when I said long exposure, I thought, you know, you think like an hour or two. Um, these, were, these are designed to be exposed for six months, yeah. continuously. So I completely got the bug for this. It's amazing, it's like, it's like a magic trick. And what's amazing is also as well, you don't have to use any chemicals to sort of process the image when it comes out of the can, because it's been in there so long. It basically sort of sunburns the image straight onto the paper. Um, and so I've been, I sort of set out to sort of document loads of sort of like the, of the sort of iconic landmarks of Brighton. This is, um, uh, uh, this was a fun thing to install but the pictures didn't come out so great, but it was at some um, Shoreham Cement Works. So I got to sort of visit some quite interesting sort of sites during the project. Uh, and so see, these are some of the results. So this is uh, Brighton Pier. Um, the sort of, you can see the health skelter there. And these lines across the sky are the sun's tracks from when it um, goes from the uh, east to the west. Uh, in the winter, when it's lowest in the sky, and then right to the summer, when it's highest in the sky, and then this being England, there's quite a lot of days when there's no sun at all. Uh, so you get this sort of interesting sort of Morse code effect. Um, so there's the, there's the Brighton Pier, there's the Peace Statue, you actually also see uh, West Pier in the distance there, um, and then there's, this was, this one uh, I had to get uh, permission, this is the, the most permission I had to get, this was, um, this is West Pier Playground, so I had to get permission from the shop where the um, there was like a sort of beach shop where I, I put the camera up. But then also I had to explain it to the seafront office, the police, uh, safeguarding, 
um, and somewhere else, someone else, um, because they were concerned that there was there would have been like thousands of children playing in this playground over that period of time. But I had to explain to them that your child would have had to have stood there, stock still for six months to be like recorded by the camera. And, I don't know, it could have been quite useful for that, but... Um... <laughs> and then finally, this is, uh, this is my daughter's old school, and it's not a particularly interesting street, but um, what uh, you can see here is that these lines are where all the different cars are parked over that time. So you get these sort of ghosts of all the cars. And then what has happened as well is like, um, so this is a tree, and you can see in the winter it's not got any um, uh, leaves on the tree, so the sun's shining through. And then in summer, it's got it, leaves have formed, and so the sun's blocked out. So you can see the whole process of the seasons in that one image of the tree. I found that the best way of installing cameras was to go in the middle of the day with high vis jacket on and uh, workman's boots and do it like as bold as brass. Um, the first one I put up, I did it dead at night, and my my neighbours shocked me to the police <laughs> <laughs> and got the got the council like signage department around the next day to sort of work out why I put this camera on the side of a building. Um, but yeah, so I, I did this in the middle of Churchill Square uh, and amazingly I came back six months later and not only was the camera still there, but workmen had very, very carefully painted around my camera. <laughs> I also do like workshops making these cameras, so um, uh, this is with schools, uh, and this is with the Science, Mu Science Museum in London. Um, it's, again, it's just so simple. You just get a, like an aluminium can, some gaffer tape, some photograph paper, and you're good to go. Um, it's really interesting sort of introducing like, young children to um, old school photographic techniques. Uh, lately, when I've been doing it, they've been, they've been going, when we, when we do the, the darkroom se section of it, they go, oh, it's like that bit out of Stranger Things. <laughs> <laughs> so they've, they've never experienced, like, what, like, what, you know, why you have a, a red room in it, a red light in a, in a dark room. Uh, this is another sort of camera I've been doing. So this is, um, uh, I just recently came back from this, this is actually um, in uh, Into the Trees Festival. Which, and it's the small sort of sister festival of um, Elderflower Fields. Um, and I was actually doing a school project there a few years ago when I saw this hut, because um, we were putting up these cameras around the forest. And I thought that would be amazing to turn into a giant camera. So I basically uh, had this, I made this um, lens cap and aperture um, slider here, and I blacked out the windows. And, uh, sorry, here we go. Here some, Amazing aluminium cutting work there, um, and I, I worked with a, like an optician to get the right strength of lens for the for the door. And yeah, you get this magical effect. This is I've taken under very sort of low light, so hence the sort of slightly sort of grainy sort of shrunkiness of it. But um, what's beautiful about this festival is it's all, it's in the middle of the forest, and so you can sort of capture these sort of upside down images of the trees and the and leaves sort of blowing in the wind um, upside down. And you can, um, this little girl is, is pulling focus on the, using a, like a whiteboard, so you can move it back and forth to get the, the focus on different objects in the distance. Uh, I've also made these little um, mini camera obscura kits that kids can put together. I've got a few of them here as well, I can show you um, after the break, or during the break rather. Uh, <laughs> and this being a festival, had all sorts of random behaviour. This is uh, one of the children's entertainers, and she was um, standing, she was doing a headstand so that um, she could be the right way up inside the, uh, inside the camera. <laughs> uh, so those are the kind of projects I was doing before the pandemic, and then the pandemic hit, and I lost all my work uh, going to you know, schools and science events and going to work abroad in sort of far-flung places like Egypt and Azerbaijan, as I mentioned before. And I kind of got this thought that, um, you know, it's a sort of momentous moment in history. And I just wanted to sort of capture, I felt like I needed to capture it in some way. And when I've been at art school, I've been, I've drawn a lot of sort of portraits of my neighbours, sorry, of my, of my classmates, rather, in the common room when I was bunking off uh, classes. Uh, and I thought I'd sort of just try and, um, you know, re-explore my ability to draw. And so this was actually my first one. This is my, I, 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 thought I'd try and draw my neighbours um, and 
and I'd only just moved into that street. So I thought I'd get to know my neighbours and we'd talk about sort of how life was during the pandemic. Um, and I'd sort of practice my drawing skills, you know, what could go wrong. Um, and so I ended up drawing about 30 uh, of the 96 houses on my street. And I'd draw these people and I'd, um, after the session, I'd write a story about the sort of conversation that we'd have and sort of about their life during lockdown and, you know, or, or their life in general as well. Um, met some very interesting people, including this guy who turned out to be a mortician. Uh, and she worked for the NHS, but I kept on going back to him, going, hey, no, yeah, I think you're very work about the NHS. Like, tell me what it's like being a mortician. <laughs> so it was really fascinating sort of meeting all these different people. And there they are. So there's, yeah, 32 people, inc yeah, including my daughter there. Uh, right? down the bottom there. Uh, oh, in fact, it's also in, in chronological order. So there's uh, my neighbor, uh, I drew my daughter second, and then uh, my, another neighbor who was an illustrator later on. And you can see that my, my drawing got much more sharper and, um, and I you know, got better as I, as I went along. So that was the summer of 2020. Uh, and uh, and we all know what happened next. We had like lockdown um, in the autumn and winter, and I've got to say, uh, lockdown in the summer was kind of all right. It was kind of fun, in like, a bit of a guilty admission. But uh, yeah, lockdown in the winter was was a shitter, really, wasn't it? To be quite frank, um, and this, it kind of put my project to an end as well because like it was too cold to sit outside drawing people. Uh, so. I thought, well, I could do it via Zoom, and I could draw people anywhere in Brighton. Hang on, I could draw people anywhere in England. I could draw any people from anywhere in the world. So I kind of got my OCD head on, and I found a, like a list of all the countries in the world, and I just, I've sort of set myself the task of drawing one person from every country in the world. There's 197 countries in the world, I've currently got to 114, so I'm over halfway, but it's, it's slowing. Uh, but certainly these are some of the portraits I've drawn during the project. Um, sorry, also, apologies if you were at my talk last year and you've heard some of this. But um, these are some of the people, so this is, um, this is one of the most surprising, I suppose. Um, I was expecting to draw someone in Iran. I was expecting them to be like a peer in a burqa and be sort of very sort of somber and um, uh, turned out to be this Kurdish woman who was very uh, cosmopolitan, was wearing lipstick, and she had her paintings on the wall of naked women, and she had these uh, musical instruments that she was playing, and she wore this um, Kurdish traditional outfit. Uh, Marshall Islands was the most, I guess, most weird uh, sort of story. Like, they live on an island, they live on a coral atoll, which is literally just a ring of coral that's left around like an old volcano, I guess. Um, and so their country is no more than 100 meters across at any one point. And so you can shout from one side of the country to the other. <laughs> um, turned out they, they kept it quiet, but one of these people is like fourth in line to be the king of uh, the Marshall Islands. Uh, this was Croatia. Um, had a very long conversation with this uh, lovely woman. I did quite fancy, I have to be honest. Um, and. Um, <laughs> I think what was interesting about this one was like they had suffered not just the pandemic, but they had suffered three major earthquakes, and so her building was shaken to pieces. Uh, and she knows, you know, that lots of people got were killed during that time. So a lot of these countries, they were dealing with other stuff as well as just the pandemic. And then this guy in Bhutan, um, I think it was probably the longest session I had. He was a, a very devout Buddhist, but also a tour guide, and he took me for a sort of tour via Zoom of his uh, hillside um, house where he's got like a bathhouse and you can see a sort of monastery on the side of the Himalayas. It was amazing. So this is a map of uh, most of the places I've drawn so far. Uh, and, uh, I forgot to mention this, I have like a spreadsheet for all these projects. I'm a bit of a, a, bit of a geek when it comes to sort of Excel and uh, Google Docs. Um, so if you know anyone in these remaining countries, then uh, yeah, do, do hit me up after the, after the talks.
Uh, so finally, this is uh, this is my last. This is my most recent project. Uh, it's the first sort of commission I've had since the pandemic, really. In fact, we had our meetings via Zoom on account of it. Um, so these are this is um, uh, Mimi from uh, Imperial College, and she um, uh, commissioned me to work with these two neuroscientists who are exploring um, uh, auditory illusions. So these are illusions where you sort of think you're hearing one thing and you're actually hearing another. There's a famous thing called the McGurk effect where people, um, if you put the video out of sync with the, the sound, it sounds like they're saying B rather than T. Um, and there's also a thing called the shepherd tone, which is a, thing, a sort of tone that sounds like a scale. It sounds like it's going constantly up, but it's, just, it's actually just the same tone, but it's been the harmonics have been phased in and out. Unfortunately, this, this, this bit sort of count. Um, I'm not very good at video and sound, so um, I, just, I think I'm going to keep this quite short. Um, what you can do, though, is in the break, I've got, um, I've got a demonstration of what I'm just about to show you in still images. Um, so, being a visual artist, I wanted to sort of find a sort of way of representing these sort of phase shift auditory illusions in some sort of um, visual way. And so I discovered this thing called um, a phenakistoscope, which was like a sort of Victorian circular um, animation technique, um, a bit like a zoetrope, but it was on a flat disc. Um, and there's a sort of modern version of it. I thought I dis discovered it all by myself, but it turns out it's a bit like a niche thing, which is if you take a record player and, s and uh, spin it at 78 RPM with an animation of 24 frames and film it on your iPhone, which or mobile phone, which is films at 30 frames a second, you get this weird animation effect. Really difficult to explain on here, but uh, yeah, come to, and I'll show you in the break. Uh, so here's um, some kids doing it. This is for Great Exhibition Road Festival in London, where all the sort of um, museums open down to the street um, for one day in June with various different sort of science activities. People filming it. And then finally, just realised that um, uh, I realised that I, I did I, I call sort of complicated sort of animation like templates that people could use. I actually just realised that if you trace around the uh, the teeth of a bicycle cog, you get this um, this weird phasing effect as well. Again, makes a lot more sense if you come and see it. So I think that's it.